Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner. We are getting the journey. And I am to apologize for this picture. I don't know what's going on. Or is it just, do I need new glasses? Or is this as fuzzy as it gets? Goodness, I hope that's not the case. However, we are going to navigate the journey, of course, even with fuzzy pictures. Today, our journey is around the world. And we are going to talk to, of course, a dear friend. I know I only talk to dear friends. Jorgen Thomas, or Thomas Jorgen, whatever way we want. But he's such a dear friend. And Thomas has international uh, radio, television, newspaper, and he does tourism around the world. So we, I asked him to talk to us today about the impact of the coronavirus around the world. It is not just Hawaii, and we see, of course, no tourism, which means our economy just goes poof. So, um, and that is what is happening in Places Hall or uh, the middle of Africa. And, and needless to say, Rome and all of those, and China, all of those big tourist spots. And so, um, you know, it's not just us, it's everywhere. So, uh, Jorgen? Aloha. There you are. Marcia, good, 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 good to have you. Even fuzzy, you, you really look good. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I know what's going on with this, this flat. Unless we're here. Okay. Uh, oh, I disappeared. Wow. <laughs> okay, let's talk to you. Let's look. let's focus on you. Tell us about Jorgen. Jorgen is your first name or last name? Yes. No, no. Jorgen is my first name. My middle name is Thomas, and most people know me under Thomas. At least those that know me for a long time, like you. And my last name is Steinmetz. Uh, so it's a good long German name. But I lived in Hawaii actually since 1988, so I've been here for a while, more than half of my life. And uh, this doesn't make me a Hawaiian, I know that, but uh, it's my home and we're all concerned about our home and um, and those that uh, um, live with us on this island, of course. Well, now, but you, now tell us about what you do. You do lots and lots of things, but um, your travel station, Travel, uh, tourism, uh, newspaper, internet, newspaper, online, uh, webinars, uh, all kinds of things around. Well, um, my, my company, I, I was the one who founded the company back in 1999, and that made us actually the first online media for the travel and tourism industry. When we first started, um, my company was a destination management organization and we represented Indonesia in the United States. And uh, when the United States uh, had travel warnings against Indonesia, we were trying to find an inexpensive way to address travel professionals, uh, specifically in the United States. Um, we teamed up with two operators and travel companies in Indonesia with the government and started sending out electronic newsletter in a Yahoo group format. You may remember this, this was back in 2000. Unfortunately, uh, the representation for Indonesia ended in 2001, mostly because of corruption issues, we couldn't get paid. But uh, we continued under the name we had established at the time, eTurbo News. We got the name actually from a sponsor, a, an eTurbo hotel company in Singapore, what was the first Expedia type online booking agent. And they handled most of the hotels in Indonesia at the time, and they were our sponsor when the government couldn't pay us. Regardless, since 2001, uh, we ventured away from Indonesia and kind of built a global database of followers in the travel and tourism industry. And I think today, without bragging, we can say we're probably uh, one of the leading, at least the oldest company in the world that reports constantly about travel and tourism issues. Uh, we have a team of uh, 200 some uh, freelance uh, journalists in every part of the world. 
Uh, we publish every hour, 24 hours a day, so we're very timely. Our news is usually not about beautiful swimming pool and beaches. We're going more in the political part. And uh, uh, and we publish currently, we, besides Itobo News, our flagship publication, we have 16 other publications, uh, including two editions uh, that are not published here, but in Germany and in, in the German language. And uh, we are partnering with 70 some travel industry events all over the world. And uh, because we're so old and so ancient, um, <laughs> in the time we we're, we're doing a lot more now than just reporting about travel and tourism issues. Um, in the travel news group, what is our roof organization, besides our publication, we run Safer Tourism. Safer Tourism is a partnership with Dr. Peter Tarlow, who is probably one of the best known experts uh, in the world in regards to travel uh, security and safety. He actually has done part of the tourism sensitivity training also here in Hawaii of HPD. Uh, he spoke at the HTA events, marketing events at the convention center several times and had also his own um, at his own evenings and uh, followership here in Hawaii uh, at events sponsored by uh, Sheraton at the time by Halakulani and, and several others in the business. But mostly uh, Peter and I, we work on, on a global scale. Right now, Peter is in charge of the uh, relaunch, tourism relaunch for Jamaica. Um, and we work in training a federal a tourism police force in Mexico. Um, uh, we're also very much involved in tourism security and sensitivity in Africa. We help with the Ebola crisis. And Peter is also um, uh, teaches also at the medical college in College Station, Texas. That's where he lives at the university there. Uh, medicine and the connection between medicine and tourism. So obviously, with this very dangerous situation now unfolding everywhere in the world, um, we, we can kind of sucked in right into the middle um, of this epidemic when it comes to reaching out to people or actually people reaching out to, to us. Um, so currently uh, we work with the World Travel and Tourism Council, what is um, a, a organization based in London and the 200 largest tourism companies are their members. In Hawaii, Outrigger is a member. And uh, one of the major sponsors is Marriott. Actually, Mr. Marriott Jr. is on the board. Uh, so we work with them on the COVID uh, task force. We work with the African Tourism Board um, on their COVID response. Um, I We have a conference call every um, Tuesday at 5 a.m. in the morning, Hawaii time. And uh, we have 17 ministers of tourism uh, joining us on this call. So we're um, bracing Africa for what is most likely coming their way. And it hasn't really hit Africa in a bad, in a completely bad way as of yet. Uh, we also work with the Vanilla Island uh, tourism people in the Indian Ocean. Very similar situation to Hawaii. Uh, island nations, island states. Uh, Rayon Yon could probably be a sister um, island for Oahu. It's part of France. It's a territory of France. It's not just uh, an overseas um, uh, colony. It's part. It's part of France. So it has uh, direct air links with Paris. What's eleven hours away? And uh, there's a lot I think we can learn from a destination like Rayon Yon because they did close their tourism arrivals completely. Uh, to their island state, what we haven't done yet here in Hawaii. Uh, their numbers are relatively low, but uh, there are um, coronavirus is present there. And um, I, I think I could go on for like an hour <laughs> more just to tell you where we're involved in. We're involved in, in a lot of different things. And yes, we also do um, webinars. Uh, we, we have our own two weekly uh, shows like yours. Uh, they are broadcast around the world and on our publications. And we recently teamed up uh, with Buzz.Travel, B-U-Z-Z dot travel. Uh, it's a new social media network um, similar to LinkedIn and Facebook, but only for travel and tourism. It's free to join. So anyone who wants to test it or try it, uh, just feel free to join us. This uh, exactly what's going in different parts of the world. You mentioned Africa. Now, 
looking at the world map, the uh, not the world map, but the World Health Organization's map, North Africa, uh, that is along the Mediterranean, North Africa, the Arab states, and then South Africa are on wedged on the, the map. But the heart of Africa, the Africans, do to be yet uh, infected with the virus. So tell me about those middle states, those 50 states in the middle, and where they are or are they infected with the virus? Well, um, obviously, uh, I, I don't have a silver plate to respond to this. This is the problem in Africa. Um, the epic center of the virus is in Europe and in New York at this time. Uh, that's where you find most of the cases. Um, but also Europe and New York and the rest of the United States, um, we have <clears throat> the money and we have the resources to do the testing. Without testing, we wouldn't know how bad or how good or how dangerous this virus is. We would probably never be able to stop the epidemic because we cannot test and don't have intelligence about it. So if you look at Africa as a whole, Africa doesn't, for the most part, have not even close to the resources we have here in the United States and the resources uh, that are available in Europe. So the numbers you see from Africa are numbers are mostly the critical numbers, those people that get sick, that need treatment, not those that are really not sick in a way that they need treatment because we they don't know for the most part if they're infected. Now, there are certain parts in Africa they are more advanced. Um, in North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco might be more advanced. In the central part of Africa, it's probably the it's third world, and it's probably the worst area on the globe when it comes to medical resources. So I wouldn't trust these numbers at all. A, a very good friend of mine is the Minister of Tourism from Sierra Leone, uh, who has been working tireless in trying to keep this virus out of her country. And now um, she had to, this is in the center of Africa, It's uh, um, and she now reports seven cases. But the seven cases is only the tip of the iceberg. I know friends I talk to in Zimbabwe um, several times a week, and they said they see um, people carried away constantly around the clock. But Zimbabwe, I think, only reports 14 cases of the virus. So the, the numbers are only as good as countries are really reporting it. South Africa may be an exception. South Africa is a first world country. They have good resources when it comes to medical care. Um, and uh, the numbers are more trustworthy. Altogether, Africa, from the numbers, is not really such a big concern. But we own, f f but a, we only know the numbers that are, are reported. And b, if you look at the same situation in North America or Europe and the history, um, it all started very small. I, I, when I left for Europe on February twenty seventh. Uh, to attend the ITB trade show in Berlin, and this show was canceled after I w already left Hawaii. Um, we only had, we literally had no cases of the virus in the US, but there were six cases in Germany. And everyone was going crazy about this, and most people laughed about it and said, why would we cancel trade shows, an event for just six people sick? Now, today, you're looking at more than 100,000 people sick. Many people died. And this is the same in New York. People have not really understood how dangerous this virus is. There's still people out there that say it's just like the flu. It's definitely not like the flu. It's way more contagious and we cannot get rid of it. And people are dying if we don't stay home, if we don't stay away, if we don't stop tourism. Um, I, I, I don't know what will happen next, specifically in an, on an island, in an island state like ours. We we have a chance to isolate ourselves. If you look at nine different other island countries in the Pacific, like Palau, like Niue, uh, like the Cook Islands, there are no cases of coronavirus. And I believe these numbers. Now, if you look at Guam, you look at Hawaii, uh, you look at um, uh, island states that are considered first world, you find an increasing number of these cases. And, uh, and that is because we're open to the outside world. 
and and uh, we, we but we have a chance to lock ourselves in there and i think this needs to happen uh, we just did an article just about two hours ago again uh, pointing out that every mayor in the state urged uh, governor egate to contact president trump and ask for uh, tourism to stop uh, to put a stop to tourism and to non-essential arrival in the state. The governor had not responded to it. You cannot just wait till these numbers go way more than 435, I guess, what they are today in the state. And this is the same with Africa. It is small, but Africa is so much more in danger because the medical resources, once it really hits, are not there to treat people and people will die. And unfortunately, people will die in big numbers, more than what we see even in our own country in New York or what we see in Rome or what we see in France. Um, interesting enough, if I can add this, I followed the situation in Europe, obviously being from Germany, having a lot of family in Germany, having my sister uh, being the assistant of the mayor in, in Dusseldorf, what is the capital city of the state most affected by this virus. Um, you get a lot of you, you let get a lot of re uh, uh, information you sometimes may not get. And if you look the approach Germany with so many people infected has compared to the number of deaths Germany has compared to Spain, Italy or France, for example, the death rate in Germany is extremely low. Why is this? Because the country from the medical point was on top of it. Um, it not like Germany contained people when they should have contained it. They made the same mistake, but the medical system is 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 there. The, the 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 equipment is there for the most part. So far, Germany has been able to handle it. If Germany will still be able to do this, if numbers go up even more, we don't know. There are some positive signs, same as in New York, that uh, the percentage of infections and you have to always look at at percentages not really at numbers because um you know if you numbers say nothing you have to see what in popular in percentage of population and there are some encouraging numbers uh, in italy there are con encouraging numbers in many parts of europe now that the percentage of the infections are slowly going down that means isolation and social distancing seems to be working it doesn't mean we can all start going out and doing what we um, wanted to do. And we don't know when this would happen. And tourism, unfortunately, will probably be the last in line uh, to get back on its feet. And that is very bad news for our state. Um, and uh, I don't know how we're going to prepare ourselves uh, for this, um, but it is a concern specifically for countries and regions that are dependent on the tourism industry. You know, Marsha, I said for many, many years, 20, 30 years, tourism is everyone's business in this state. I don't think anyone it ever is. wanted to listen to Everybody's me, but we have said it over this. and over and over again. Even if you're not involved in the tourism industry, it's our industry in the state, no matter if what you do. And uh, now oh, yeah. we There's see so the danger it puts us in. Yeah, the, all of these small businesses depend on tourism restaurants, uh, the movie theaters, uh, everything depends on tourism. And when you don't have new people coming, then it all falls apart. Uh, tell us, speaking of Hawaii, what about the whole Asian countries around the, the not down into India, of course, but um, Sierra Leone, uh, those places right at, as you go down from China, those small countries, uh, how are they doing? Yeah, the Sierra Leone is in West Africa, just for your oh, information. Yeah, no, it's not I, that much but, and actually Sierra Leone um, is known for the Hawaii of Africa uh, because right. it has beautiful beaches like we do. But when you go to East Asia, um, the uh, of course, uh, China, Hong Kong, um, uh, if you look at Singapore, if you look at Indonesia, if you look at the Philippines, um, the virus is everywhere and it's threatening every economy, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa or South America these days. And the situation in Asia, I think it almost appears 
when we hear the news and when we hear what the world, world is talking about, it kind of, it's in the process of leaving Asia. So it's not um, the epic center anymore, even though the epic center started in, in, in China, in a, in a province in China, but it's no longer there. Now, when, when you really look at the number of people infected during the entire crisis, ever since the virus was started, we were all talking about China and this one province and what it did to China. Now, if you look at the numbers today and compare the numbers with any country in Europe, for example, it is three or four times as many people sick as there were in China in percentage of the population. China has more than a billion people. And, and, and if you actually look at it, the most affected country in the world right now for this virus is a little tiny country. It's called San Marino. It's uh, in the northern, surrounded by Italy, close to Rimini. That's where the epic center is and was in Italy when it's all started. Uh, this country has 20 times more in people infected based on population percentage than Italy. Now, the United States, because of wide open regions like, like Kansas, like Missouri, like Nebraska, where the virus ha hasn't hit the same way it hit in New York in dense populated uh, um, areas, our number is quite low. We're only about 10% um, percentage wise what Germany, for instance, is doing and what other people, um, where other people stand. But you cannot see it like this either, because it looks like the virus is most dangerous in populated areas. Um, and, and I think uh, if, if uh, regions like uh, in Texas or uh, regions in, in Nebraska or Kansas manage to stop movement, they can be in a lot better shape, of course, than New York or the East Coast, or unfortunately, the West Coast major cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, <clears throat> Seattle uh, may ever be in. So it is, uh, there are a lot of factors that come together when it comes to this virus. And talking about Africa, the central part of Africa is desert. Yes, and they may be able to keep it under control better than major cities with millions of people like Lagos in Nigeria, for example, like Accra in Ghana, like uh, Nairobi in Kenya, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, or Kampala in Uganda, uh, Johannesburg or Cape Town, or many of the other million people cities, we, some of them we don't even know here. The danger is density. The danger is mingling, um, having people around. Um, the, the only way to really keep this virus under control is distancing. And um, it is hard because we as people, we're not people who want to distance. We want to have a cup of coffee with someone. We wanted to have lunch together. And we want to go on vacation to enjoy a vacation together. Where we will, how long this will take, I think it would all depend on how our behavior is and not only our local behavior, but global behavior in this case. Well, uh, Jorgen, now tell me, speaking of islands, um, the Caribbean, uh, what about those islands? Yeah, and I forgot to mention, I'm actually a member of the Tourism Resilience uh, Board. Um, uh, in It's based in Jamaica. It was started by the government of Jamaica by uh, Edmund Bartlett, who is the Minister of Tourism and a very good friend now. And the Resilience Center is now uh, spread out throughout the Caribbean, but also to places like Nepal, Japan, um, uh, Bangkok, and, uh, and so forth. The, uh, the numbers in the Caribbean are relatively low compared to the numbers in, um, in many other parts of the world. Uh, the Caribbean, except for some exceptions like Havana, for instance, in Cuba, um, or um, very few places have really very dense areas. Um, so do you have metropolitan area like you have Honolulu, but even a city like Honolulu with our size is hardly found anywhere in the Caribbean. So for the most part, the numbers in the Caribbean are under control. The islands um, without exceptions are uh, now quarantined and people cannot leave. And, uh, and it's, uh, but then again, all the numbers started slow. I had an interesting case actually um, 
uh, a, 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 a guy from Germany who was, um, his mother is a good friend um, from my sister. He traveled on a sailing boat around the world. He, le he left Germany almost a year ago. And when the virus hit in, in he was in Grenada and his family, his two kids and his wife flew to Grenada. This was all before this virus broke out. And they're currently locked on their sailing boat in the harbor in, on the island of Grenada. And uh, he's only allowed to go to a small, tiny grocery store once a week. So it, it hits a lot of people from all over the world and it hits the travel and tourism industry. Um, just uh, also recently, two or three days ago, Another good friend of mine, her, her name is Francois Kemala. She used to be the Minister of Tourism for Cameroon. And uh, she came to ITB Berlin, like I did. And ITB Berlin, the largest travel trade event, was canceled just two days before. We met briefly in Berlin, and she was going to New York to do some work for her embassy in New York, assigned to the United Nations. And she was supposed to be in New York for four days. And when she was ready to get back to Cameroon, all the flights were canceled. There was no more flight to get her anywhere even close to Cameroon. So she desperately trying to get back to her kids and her family in Cameroon had waited for more than two weeks um, to be able to be and finally booked on a United Airlines flight to Frankfurt and on a connecting flight to Paris, where she wanted to await for a rescue flight the Cameroon government had put together on April 17th. When she left on United, United left her, let her board, and when she arrived in Frankfurt to change to Paris, she was not admitted into Germany, even though she had a valid visa, she had a valid US visa, and she was stranded in the transit hall for two days at Frankfurt airport. And finally, uh, her a foreign ministry in Cameroon intervened uh, with authorities and with the help of the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt, she was able to be deported and get back on a flight in Newark, and that's where she started out and now is stranded in Newark again. There are so many little well, stories, you know, you hear. Yes. <laughs> it is, it well, is listen, incredible. We are out of time, but of course, I can always listen to your stories from around the world. And I think you said for seeing this time with us and telling all these wonderful stories and connecting the world for us. And you will come back and hopefully we can figure out why this is so fuzzy. But again, <laughs> okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. It's a and pleasure being on your show. Aloha thank you, Marsha. And, and we'll see you next time.